Welcome to Podcast of the Rings, the first time we aren't going to officially talk about an episode of Podcast of the Rings or the series because we don't have to, but we luckily, happily, uh, joyously, joyously have... To it. A, it is joyously. <laughs> uh, a, a guest, Alex. We have a guest. I'm well, so excited. Are you my special guest today, Alex? I'm always your special guest. Yes, you are. Who's our special guest, Alex? We have Anthony Crum joining us. The one and the only Antimo, our favorite. It will remain our favorite character from Rings of Power. We're, thank you for joining us, Anthony. No worries. The afterlife is a special place, and I'm glad to come um, from beyond death. Just no, green, I don't know, I don't know if, green fields. I have a Kiwi accent now. See. I don't know if you guys know this, but Valinor is it's it's New Zealand. So, uh, <laughs> oh, well, I think Peter Jackson would have it that way. Yeah, <laughs> it probably is. <laughs> We and have yet to see Valinor, right? So we don't we don't know. Yeah, it's just um uh Flight of the Concords, Take Away TT is there. <laughs> Are you friends with him now that you're a big actor in New Zealand? <laughs> no. I think he lives doesn't he live in America? No, he's I'm forgotten sure. about us. He's he's like, I'm here now. Guys stop stop posting me. Um, <laughs> we're good. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't know. I don't know. I've never seen him. If I saw him, I I would be very nervous around him. That that's so. I don't know. I don't know. I, he's very famous. He's very famous. Yeah. I had the mm. pleasure of uh, meeting a very famous person a couple months ago, and and I know all sorts of people, and I work with all sorts of people. But this was just another echelon of fame that I wasn't prepared for. It was Seth MacFarlane, mm-hmm. and I was I. Oh I've, wow! I know I've hung out with him. We've gotten dinner, and wow. he's a big fan of another podcast. I know exactly. So it's like our Taika, kind of in a sense, and yeah. it tested my um, nerves. <laughs> Let's just put yeah. it that way. They're just people. Like it's a hard thing to like to in your mind to rectify the image of what they are and then the, who they actually are. That's what. You, yeah. Oh, well, I recognize that we probably would have been friends anyway. But just to be honest, I'm nervous to interview you because I feel like we're <laughs> friends already. I think you're great. We loved. I, I Alex wasn't a fan Im- immediately, and then he became a fan. I hate to admit it. When I first <laughs> saw Antimo, I was like, "This kind of it doesn't mesh with a sealed or Valandil or you know these like very forwards you know manly men." When you think of him, like who who's this guy? But yeah. warmed up to Antimo and. I'm sad to see what happened to him in the end. He's a group mediator. That's what he is. Yeah, uh, he, he tries to, you know, hold Valandiel back, and he does. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's like the. I reckon he's out of the three. He's the one who most looks feels like a young. Um, he's like I was the trying youngest. To hold that note. He's definitely the youngest guy, and you play. You like when you won me over. Uh, you didn't have to, but I loved when like he was about to throw up, and I'm like, oh, I know that feeling so well. You remind, uh, Antimo felt like the guy who you've been friends with since elementary school, who came up with you, and you're never yeah. you're never gonna stop being friends with that guy unless mm. he dies. <laughs> <laughs> He's the tag along. I did think about him as Sam. Um, Sam, yeah. if he was yeah, yeah less courageous, um, uh, which. I don't know. It's innocent as well. Well, I think Sam became courageous because he had something to come mm. back for and or to go with. And your thing was back there. And you're like, hey, I almost died. And I got to go. <laughs> I haven't gotten laid yet. I think we, we'd like to think that you got laid. <laughs> you probably, Antimo probably got busy. There was probably no, you know, taboo about having Yeah, that actually, we marriage. shot that and they got cut. So, yeah. <laughs> thing. I didn't think it worked with the rest of the, yeah. That's something we have talked about on the show is how much we realize must be on the cutting room floor from this oh, show. Man, yeah. And, I've, yeah, that goes right in there. Heaps, heaps. Yeah, yeah. I, well, even just watching it, just like, just bits that, I don't know, give context. You, all right, I think I was listening to a few of your episodes and you're like, oh, I guess that just happens off screen. And they did yeah. shoot it and then they just hit it. So then those scenes later on where you see them and they like progressed further in the relationship, you're just like, 
well, what happened there? That's what happened is that it got, I guess it just was, didn't make the cut. So yeah, there's so much to, yeah. to tell so much story to tell. So in only an hour, there's so many episode, characters, so. how, it's like yeah. how many characters, it's like a, a billion and two characters, yeah. I think in this yeah. show. That's the population of New Zealand, right? It's like just, <laughs> yeah, just under that's that. Right. <laughs> that's right. Well, we, yeah, we have all of the people who have died, right? So, um, cause we are <laughs> the afterlife. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Well, so a friend of mine was on um, a Star Trek show and her character was um, polarizing because it's questionable under what circumstances she committed a sexual act with another character. And oh. all the context for that was cut out. And like oh. her big scene for the relationship and the complexity of it was whittled down to, you know, them rounding the corner and she's saying something, like, something very curt. Um, which is complicated when you then you start like conflating the actor like well why would the actor make a choice to play a role like that and yeah because she doesn't she, you know to Star Trek especially you don't walk away from the, the franchise ever you mm. are now always going to the Star Trek conventions and so people are always going to ask the same questions yeah it's it's, it's hard too because you're imagining because you have your scenes of the script so you're making choices based on what you what your scenes are. So sometimes you'll make choices that don't make sense when it, after it's cut, Is it, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like you'll be like, oh, they'll, they'll understand this choice because of what they said before. But what if they cut out the first part? Then that what your choice later on seems so bizarre. It's just not And people will be like, that's bad anything. acting. But it's based on something you haven't, that you, was, that you thought was going to be seen. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's just the nature of filmmaking. So, yeah, I actually am curious. So you do a lot of live performance. Comedian, stand-up comedian is like the one thing I, I'm i scared to do. But it feels oh. like, I know, it feels like eventually I'll probably do it because it just kind of got to. But when did you say, oh, I'm going to do, well, it probably is the same situation as like you want to do comedy, but you also got to do TV and film because that's where money is. Is that is that what it was for you? Yeah, 100%. I think I started doing stand up because I just wanted to perform and I hadn't like been cast in anything. So, and I just like, ex I, just, I, I want to. And also the one to one ratio between you write it and then you perform it that night. Like, there's no middle person. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I, yeah, you're exactly right. I, I, I would love to make money from, from acting and then do stand up at night. That would be like my dream. I think that's a great goal, though. I think, you know, anyone says make money where you can and then go do the thing you want to do. What would you say your stand up style is? Like where do you Whimsic get your whimsical. <gasps> I, I I came to America and um it is I don't know. I said, I went to Austin, Texas, which again is its own variety of um a particular taste of comedy. But it's very like edgy and um people are trying to make jokes about the most topical um top topics. I don't know any way, the way to say it, but um and so who, whoever can make the best joke about the most topical thing will hopefully, you know, get some sort of fame or some leverage for their career um, because it's so competitive. But in New Zealand, it's such a small niche little um, uh, gr group of comedians. So we get to do kind of what we want. Um, and we are just whimsical, <laughs> very silly, very like um, Reese Darby, if you know Reese Darby, um, yeah. kind of underplaying things like Taika Waititi's humor. Um, a flight of the Concord is very much like they're not necessarily talking about biting issues or trying to be contentious. They're just um, kind of silly stories, silly characters. Um, yeah, whimsical. So, are you are you playing as characters? Because Alex and I just watched all of the James A. Caster series. So that, uh -huh, when, yes. when you say whimsical, I'm thinking that. Yes, and that's yeah, yeah, all I want to watch now. Very much. Uh, I, yeah, I, I love James Acaster. He's like one of my favorite comedians. And yeah, what, one of the reasons I think about him a lot when I'm trying to write things. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. You would be a wonderful opener for him. Oh, well, um, please. I'm going to will that. I'm going to will that for you. <laughs> Could you That's ask Seth MacFarlane if he knows James? All famous people know each other, right? They're all in like a group chat. That's I all I can imagine that. that that's the case. And it's because all the poor people know each other, too. <laughs> <laughs> we, we all, and you're, you're no longer that, yeah. I'm sure. So you've skyrocketed. As soon as I get into that group chat, you will never see me again. We I forget. Will... <laughs> 
It's just like, do you remember Jessica? No, nah, she's a bitch. I have no idea you took that. <laughs> no, you like your 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 memory gets totally erased. I love uh, that. Yeah, whimsical is my style. I would say. Um, and you do improv too. I do. Yes. Is that something you hide from the world, or is it something you're proud of? I do hate the clappy, happy, clappy, you know, vibe of um, of improv sometimes. But I do also love it. I love how it's so hard because only the people on the night get to experience it. It's, we're talking about improv as like talking about dreams in that, um, you know, we did this great scene and I, I was on a bus and he was a clown and people kind of zone out halfway through. It's also like when people talk about their D&D games and you're like, yes. oh, yeah, I've got this character. He's this dwarf and we were fighting. By the, it's so complex and so specific. It's like an inside joke. But I do love be doing it. Um, uh, <laughs> it I've never fun. described it like that. And it's perfect, which is why I realize I don't invite people. Like, right. it's because it's the post show. You go to the post mm. show, everyone has a drink, and you talk about this awesome thing that only the 17 people saw. Yes. Or yes. you remember it 10 years from then. Yes. Oh, I've and never... it's so moving for the people who are there, and I do love it. And if you do go to an improv show, it will be one of the most memorable. You can be one of the most memorable moments of your life. But talking about it to other people is difficult. It, it, it becomes your own little... People in the room, it becomes your inside experience um and if you film it it doesn't really translate it's not that quite well. this it's not quite the same i mean if you're wonderful or like a Kristen wig i think True. um mm. i've tried to sh i did we did um over the pandemic an improvised medical drama and mm -hmm. dramedy and i would say that worked but it and then we also tried to do a um improvised film so like we would get a suggestion at the beginning of the day the, oh, the crew cool. i know you would probably love it uh the crew was ready to shoot it we just had no idea we were getting put in makeup and hair and then we were told and then we got to decide what characters we wanted but it wasn't good unless you were told that it was improv and if you just watched exactly it, yeah right it was like oh okay this is like mid-level acting mm. Great. There's that book called uh, The Days and oh, the Nights of Second City, and I think the producer talks about that. He's like, I don't really like improv because it only works about 60% of the time. Um, so why wouldn't you just make something that's good? But when it does work and you know that it's improvised, it can be one of the most magical experiences ever. So, Okay, so a, talk about your dream. What's the best improv? <laughs> what's the best <laughs> improv moment you've ever had? And we'll, we'll pretend like we're riveted. Oh my god! <laughs> best, best improvised uh, moment that I've ever had was I think did a great scene with my friend Mel, and it was about a husband and a wife, and he suspects that she's cheating on him, and we we like improvised a drama technique where I was responding to questions, I was watching. I don't know if you've seen The Chase before. Have you seen The Chase? It's not familiar, no. no. Um, it's just like a game show where they ask questions. Oh, sort of like um, um, give me uh, what is a hamster for 500? What's that called? <laughs> uh, you mean Jeopardy? Jeopardy. Jeopardy, yeah. So yeah. Got like, it. like that. Okay, like got that. It. <laughs> and, then the, and somebody was playing the TV and then the TV started asking me questions about our relationship. And then it got into this deep kind of um, introspective piece about – um, about relationships, about love. And so, and it was happening in real time in front of people. And so I was just like, wow, this is, you know, an incredible conversation that you, that you can have. And we just kind of made it up and it just happened. Um, and it, like, I wanted to cry and people, you know, wanted to, yeah, it was just, it was so good. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Oh, just, this actually sounds beautiful. That's like, it's one of those things when all of a sudden it's happening, everyone's like lifted off the floor like a half an inch and you you don't know. You, and then it's over, you know, it's mm. like so ephemeral in that way. That's awesome. It's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the good word for it. Yeah. Uh, and dangerous. It feels dangerous because you don't know where they're going to go. Yeah. For me, improv was... Um, the way I talk about it or when I do talk about it, which is frequently, obviously, um, it, I needed it to not be afraid as much. I would, especially going into scenes, I would pre-plan too much. Or if I said something incorrectly or miss, you know, missed a line, my whole body would leave or my, my soul would leave my body in a scene as opposed to just be present with what was going on in the moment. And right. improv helped me 
stay grounded in those uncertain moments. Yeah, the, actually, there's a moment in Lord of the Rings where I say, I think they, it's the, and it's a, the take that they use, and I'm like, um, um, more like a whole li- a whole lifetime. I forgot my lines in that in that brief moment. So in that moment, I'm like struggling to get the lines out, and then to save it, I just look sad, and it just ended up working for the scene because <laughs> it looks so heartbreaking. This character who's like, yeah, it's really hard. Um, and we did have a lot of time to show like the because um, we only had that one scene to show the effect of war, which is because like it's such a big part of Tolkien Tolkien's story is yeah. that he went to war and then had the effect about it and then the, all these stories kind of come from the the horrors of war so i really wanted them to explore that more in the film and we only had that we only had that one scene to try and make it work and, but they i remember also somebody said i remember hearing somebody's like we have to have the scene make the scene light because the rest of the episode is so dark and so i was like wow oh, god no i had my whole head i was like oh this has to be like a moment of catharsis but so we just ended up having to play it light but then we had this one moment where my character goes, you know, I don't want to be here anymore, which is so relatable to a lot yeah, of people, yeah. I imagine. And it's um, it's heartbreaking, like, yeah. watching that, you know. Um, yeah. But, yeah. yeah, it was genuinely me going, like, um, oh, lifetime. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I, like, I'm struggling to find the words because I am. Um, yeah. But it works for the entire... S- sometimes... So you yeah. summed up the... The pain of war in one forgotten moment. <laughs> well, so thank Alex you so is much. The I'm always getting invited to the group chat. It's interesting. <laughs> Just off that. Just we off can't that. wait. Uh, <laughs> we're gonna, we'll send you our numbers. Uh, <laughs> Alex is the Tolkien crazy person, and I'm like the Tolkien mm-hmm. fan. I, I was mm-hmm. raised on it forever. So Alex is the one who always tries to tell me it's not allegorical, but you also can't not have your life experiences pepper the stories you're writing. And I'm more curious for your, for you, were you going into this? Well, A, did you know when you were auditioning that this was Lord of the Rings and B, when you found out, we are like, awesome. I love Tolkien or I've never watched it or read it. Let me do like, where were you coming in from? Yeah. I heard that they were going to shoot something here. Lord of the Rings. I remember sitting in my bed and being like, please, please let me be on that. Um, and then nothing happened. And then finally I got an audition for, I guess it was just like whispers. It was called the untitled Amazon project. But everyone knew it was Lord of the Rings. Um, and the reason why I want to be in it is because it's such a huge deal in New Zealand in terms of um, a development in our film, in our industry. So my drama teacher was in it and we were like, wow, that's amazing. And we watched his scenes and he became like this figure to us. And because of that, you know, they were, you know, it was just, it was amazing. It was an amazing film. I love the films. Um, wasn't allowed to watch them as a kid because I was a Jehovah Witness. Oh, so, wow. And no longer? I, no longer, no longer. Yeah. yeah. Um, but wow. my, my parents just wouldn't let me watch it or Harry Potter. So I came to these sort of like things quite late. I think I, I saw it when I was in intermediate school, like through uh, the window uh, of a library. And I was like, what is that? And I came and I sat down. And the, my, the librarian just had it on a TV. Started watching it like third film in, like no context. And I was like, this is incredible. And then just didn't think about it until later. Um, and then when I auditioned for it, I watched, I was like, I want this so bad. So I watched all the films back to back the night before the audition. Um, I auditioned with my good friends. Like, so I just try to set it up as best as possible. And as soon as we did the audition, I was like, oh, this feels like a world I could really, really live in. Um, but I wasn't a fan. I wasn't a fan of the entire entirety of the work. I was a fan of Peter Jackson's um, work. And then now knowing it, now after getting the role and investigating it, I was like, oh, Tolkien is, Tolkien's work was so deep. Like it's almost religious in its depth. It's so widespread. And then just the challenge of bringing that into a story is oof, like, that must be so hard for Patrick and um, the, you know, the creators like, uh, especially so um, we definitely no, don't uh, Alex has been very helpful to me for avoiding the conversation of just the very hateful people because it's not helpful to a conversation and mm. being critical of something is different than being hateful but I do mm. feel that um, the people who know the most about 
the world are the could be the most critical when they're mm. at the I think they're at a deficit when they could just enjoy something because it, it can't mm. there's so many different ways the show could have been written and if you just release some of that I think you could en- just enjoy it actually for what it is and you probably coming into it not having like all like you're not Christopher Lee that's like been, like dragged down with all the books knowledge I think actually Christopher Lee hadn't read any of them yet either right Alex was it no, he, he he actually was a huge... I think you're thinking maybe yeah. Ian McKellen. McKellen didn't know. Christopher Lee yeah. was a huge Tolkien huge fan. fan. Like, met Tolkien um, before he passed. Um, but yeah, I think Ian McKellen came in maybe and hadn't read the books. There's pros and cons, I guess, to both. Because yeah. one, you're second guessing everything that the show's doing if you know everything about the law, And the other one is then you can just play the... It's probably easier just to play the character's re- uh, reality. Um, because you don't, right. you're not tied down by everything that happens thousands of years later you're just playing a character in a time in a context so i guess there's pros and cons to both well and i think that that's what worked for me and that kind of gives you the freedom to be Antima, who we'd never heard before and mm. and now you get to play the guy who's like the, the dorkiest guy in the numenorian town you know like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we need you so we can relate yeah. to you somehow yeah well, not yeah, dorky. I, you just, you just, you're, you're like the most lovable Numenorean. Everyone else is like, I'm really cool. And I eat muscles. And... Yeah, dorky. I think I dork, dorky is not so far from. What, I'm just trying to find the. Be. I couldn't find the right term. He's he's like dopey. Might be close, close. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I always, I said to Alex, you might have heard this. Like you, your character definitely led from the tummy. You know how some characters lead from the head or from the groin. You walked with like your all your feelings started with stomach aches. I think. Yeah, heart, heart and stomach was my my two bleeding centers. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you do that work as an actor, but that's um, yeah. basic the same phrase for some. Or it's a different phrase for the same thing. I think. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Heart, heart, heart. He's just. Um, he, he feels a lot of grief and f- feels a lot of love. I don't know. Um, trying to keep his friends together. We all have that, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite often that person in relationships trying to like mediate situations. So I was just trying to do that as best as I could in the relationship on screen. Well, that asks, asks the question, why are all your relationships so drama filled? In real life. Yeah, don't tell me about it. Why you tell me about it? <laughs> Should, why are you asking me, buddy? Ask my friend. I, I mean, friend. let's get him on here. Let's let's put let's put the group text on. Blast. I'm like, come on, guys, come in. Yeah. <laughs> what We're is waiting in the wings? Just be just be supportive of each other. Um, <laughs> so it was a self tape, or did you get to go in? It was um, no, it was a self tape. That's, oh, a, that's well, amazing. Because it was because well, you got to think because like we were sh- as COVID was COVID was at its height when we were making this, so right. it was so hard um, because of that. There were so many new things that we were trying to work out how to do. Well, uh, yeah. So I mean, just was, to stand out in a self tape is so hard. Like I know I do, mm, I do better when I'm in the room, and sure. I feel like you must love like you. Just, if you can just be in the room and like meet people, you're like, oh, I they don't like me. See you later. Have a nice life yeah. but to but to have reached them through self-tape that's a really great accomplishment that, that, that makes you feel like a million bucks because sometimes you feel like you never they never even see it yeah yeah um well i was talking with my friends and the basis of the character is if, i mean he is a he's just the he's a friend <laughs> i don't know so it, i think that just translated really well um i think probably the i did with my good friend andy um and we were just joking. It just felt like we were just joking around. It felt like I was just talking to my friend. So when I found out that who he was, essentially, he was a sealed doors friend, um, I was like, that's not make sense. That must have been what they saw. I, I mean, hands down. I think thinking about him as a Sam is exactly right. Um, mm. But And I think that that's a good thing, too. And maybe, like, maybe you can uh, uh, extrapolate, not extrapolate, elongate my thought. Again, I'm really great with words. Um, when you're not playing, when you're trying to play a character that you think is supposed to be a certain way or that, that isn't like resonating with you, that's when you're not going to book the job. Like, even if it wasn't written that way, if you're playing it authentically as some, as a version of you, you're probably going to play it there. Uh, that will resonate with people that are watching it and with you in the storytelling of it. For sure. Yeah. You want people to be like, I recognize that type of person. Um, and then whilst serving the function to the story 
I feel those are the two things I think about. Sure. Um, so it's been, you... I think that's what people have been saying. They were like, ah, I kind of know this. Like, even you just saying that, I know that person in the friend group. I was like, what I was trying yeah. to hope, I was hoping that that would, that people would think that. Yeah. I think that that's probably why you're, he resonated with us is because you want, I'm at the stage of my life where I only want my nice friends around. I only want my supportive friends. It took me a long time to like the nice guy in relationships too. And Alex is the mm. nicest. He's a little smarmy. Um, but I kind of, <laughs> yeah. I kind of like that he is very intelligent, but also knows it. But I'm, I'm, I kind of, I actually, like, my heart bled when you weren't either of theirs best friend. <laughs> Right. Like, yeah, what the hell? We added that in. We sort of added that moment in. We did that in rehearsal, and I was cause like, we wanted it to be funny. <laughs> yeah. Be funny if he was like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was a friend. Um, Now's not so the funny. time. <laughs> yeah. Um, because I don't think that was originally in there in that in the script. But yeah. I think we've all been that person too. Whether whether we are all the nice friend in that, we've all been in a dynamic where it's like. Ah, they're those two people are the closest, and everyone likes me, but not the same as those two like each other. Like the third wheel, I guess. Yeah. Is, I'm saying yeah, I'm sure. reinventing how to say the third wheel in a very um, poetic way. Yeah, yeah, it happens with couples as well. Like if you're friends with couples, I'm like I've been a friend with couples, and you, yeah, you're you're literally the the, <laughs> the third wheel. Um, you're friends with both of them in different ways um, and just want them to be know, happy together. And then when they turn to you, they, they inevitably do the thing where they turn to you and be like, what do you think? And you go, well, I can't comment because I love you both equally. So, um, yeah, it's a hard position to be in. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think if you – because if you start with one side, you can't talk about the other side or how do you stay – it's nice when you have like a little bit like if, if you're in that situation and both of them are responsible to know that they shouldn't come to you for those things. Yes. That's yeah, when it's in sure. that nice. But but instead, like you're going to go, I am so upset right now. Please don't tell him. And that's, <laughs> yeah, it's not I fair. don't know what to do. I've definitely done both. I've definitely been like, yeah, he was a he was a bastard to you in that moment. And then I felt really bad about that because I felt like I was just trying to appease them. And then I've done the other thing where I'm like, I can't comment. And then they feel like they're not heard. So I don't know what to do. That's tough. Uh, that's very yeah, tough. I, I think the, uh, without giving you advice, but wanting to give you advice, the thing I try to do is I, I will be as honest with everybody as I want to be. Or like mm. I, if, if someone asks me for their opinion, I will ask them if they want my opinion or advice. And if they want me to be truthful, I will tell that guy the same thing that I'm going to tell her. You were a dick in that moment and she deserved better. And But you also goaded him because you're not perfect either, you know. But yeah. it depends on how uh, able people are to take that feedback. Alex, what's hey, your least favorite quality You'd be a great on tomorrow, me? I think. Oh, no, no, I'm not. Alex is on. No, I, Alex isn't even on to Mo. My sister, I'm trying to think who's on to Mo in my life. My youngest brother. You and him would be buddies. Okay. Or you would fight each other for like the same position. In, no, he would like, my brother was like the kind of kid who would bring home strays. He like, hey, uh, Jack doesn't have anywhere to sleep tonight. Can uh, he have dinner with us? And then he'd like live with us for th yeah. three months. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a real, that seems, seems like what on to Mo would do. <laughs> totally or like Antima was the kid that was always at other people's house <laughs> like having right. a dinner and then going to other people's house for dinner are you gonna leave Antima? like uh, like <laughs> like um so um you're gonna go back <laughs> and he's like oh, oh no my parents are on vacation actually so <laughs> they said i could stay with you guys that's a hundred percent what happened See, that's a <laughs> yeah, that's another sure. scene that i'm sure is on the cutting room floor that i wish we would have gotten to see it was a lady you know, we and yeah. yeah, they didn't cast a younger Antimo too. I had to play, you know, I just had to raise my voice up to be right. They, well, they they took that from the Peter Jackson films with a forced perspective. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they made giant tables that you were sitting at to make you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! I can't wait till the behind the scenes comes out for that. You guys will love. Oh it. my gosh! Yeah. So much. <laughs> That's thrilling. So. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Bye. No. <laughs> <laughs> You are, yeah. are you, do you guys celebrate Halloween? Is that a thing? Uh, yes, we do. I mean, there's Indiana Jones, uh, not too long ago. Um, so it was yesterday, essentially, for you guys. 
Yeah, well, although we had a party two days ago. Right, so you do the Halloween weekend kind of party. Extends to, yeah, it can extend to like four days, doesn't it? Well, I mean, there's. I'm still going to party. I haven't didn't do anything this weekend, but I could if I want to go to parties this coming weekend too. So when it's like in the middle of the week, it's an excuse for everyone to do it whenever they <laughs> yeah. want. Yeah. What do you guys think of it? Well, Alex doesn't. First of all, Alex has never cosplayed in his life. Yeah, yeah. He's like a. Mm. He, we're all we're D and D. We know each other because I used to do D and D online and, uh-huh. um, because the uh, as you know, if you do D and D, improv bleeds directly into yes, that for sure. So there was actually I, a call. I started D and D right as I got the role, and I thought because we didn't get told what character or world or uh, race we were going to be, so I th- really thought I was going to be a dwarf. And um, oh my god! And I was like, I got to do lots of research about this, and so I was obviously listening to everything, and so I created a dwarf character, um, and. Uh, I also gave them an RP accent so they could practice the accent. And then they told me that I was a human. And I was very disappointed. <laughs> oh, no. oh, that's so sad. Yeah. His what name was is your Ronith dwarf's Rockseeker. name? Ronith Rockseeker. Ronith Rockseeker. And he, d- yeah, he desperately wanted to be a human. Um, that was his character. Well, actually, there's some fortune. There's like some fortune telling in that. Though. I know. Yeah. It's very weird. Very weird. <laughs> Why did he want to be a human though? He just he's like a self hater. Don't, don't know. Uh, he, oh, he his one of his the masters. Also, he was a I was a cleric. Was that what they called? Sure. Yeah. And the person who brought him into the faith was a human, and he uh, idolized him so much that he wanted to be him so badly oh. he, that he wanted even to be a human. I'm gonna gift you a name that I will never use again. But I tried Please. to be. I think I literally was a cleric as well. Um, Hawkward. Hammer sword? Hawkward. Hawkward. So it's like awkward, but Hawkward. I think yeah, it was yeah. like Hammerstone or Hammer Sword. So I was pretty proud of that name. So like sometimes I actually played a, um, there's a, it's not D&D, but it's like a dice game called Lasers and Feelings. And depending on mm-hmm. how you roll, you either are more technically uh, advanced or more emotionally advanced. And oh. my character, I think, was emotional. And I, I've uh, modeled him after... Han Solo, and I called him um, Harrison McFly ship. <laughs> and I was very proud of that. Yeah, that's a great name. Harrison yeah. McFly. What else is he going to be? Do you know who he is? Anyway. It's like yeah. when someone has the name like Mason or Smith. It just describes what they do. A hundred percent. Ontimo's name means Stone Mason. So I didn't know oh, how really? much to read into that. but I didn't know that. I was like, maybe you come from Masons or something. What maybe his his family was responsible for building the the big statue of Arendil. I mean, you said that. that. I didn't say that, but let's let's just go with that. <laughs> yeah, how much is there that you like in terms of NDA stuff? Like, because we we have we have briefly touched upon scenes mm-hmm. that are on the cutting room floor. Are you are you actually allowed to talk about uh, things that weren't released in the? I think I'm allowed to talk about it. Um, okay, pretty sure I'm allowed to talk about it. I mean, I, the hardest it was so shattered in mystery. A lot of it. Yeah. But, and, and it's good that it's all come out now. And I'm obviously, I'm dead. So, um, <laughs> I have no. <laughs> Not a lot of repercussions for you yeah, exactly. at this point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Loose cannon. <laughs> um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't huge. All, none of our, none of our big scenes got cut. It was just like little moments here and there got cut. Um, yeah. Yeah. But like, like when you're with point... Hallbrand, you're not like, oh, that's Sauron. You have no yeah, idea. Yeah, no, that no, that's... they cut that. I did do that actually. Um, <laughs> that was just me improving, you know. It's like, like uh, uh, it. no, he's not. <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> no, um, no, no. Uh, why, what makes you think that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I keep looking at the camera and going, "I'm Sauron." Wink, <laughs> and then they were like, "No, you're not." I'm surprised they wouldn't have used that in the promo materials because they were. <laughs> I know. Like they I were know. pushing that so hard. Who's Sauron? I, know. Actually, uh, I there was a rumor. There was a rumor that he was. Well, I didn't even know, but there was a rumor that he was, and so yeah, I remember like wanting to ask him, but not being. And sitting, I was I remember sitting in trailer with um, Charlie, and just looking over it and being like, trying to like suss him out and be like, is he evil? And I was like trying to work it out. I don't know because I didn't know any of his scenes. All I had was his costume. Sure. And talking to him. And I was like, he could be Sauron, I don't know. <laughs> that Maybe seems I'm like a Sauron. really interesting set meta, though, too, because 
one of the things, and forgive me for speaking for you all this time, Alex, is uh, he, I think we went back and forth as to whether the showrunners wanted it to be who's uh, like this whole season to be who's Sauron, or is it something that we just put on to it as people who knew that Sauron was eventually going to make a debut? Um, so was it was it like the everyone's like oh I think this person oh, I think that. or it wasn't overtly stated to me but that seems I, I have the same read out as you I think yeah. that was what they were trying to do at points to the, to to the detriment of the show in my opinion but um yeah because I was just like yeah okay <laughs> um is it <laughs> uh, tell please tell me <laughs> um. It shows at its know. best when it's focused on the relationships, right? Yeah, um, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, um, and, and I, you know, if, in rewatching the whole series and taking a step away from it, I'm not a highly critical person, and mm-hmm. if I like something, I'm really going to enjoy it. Um, I did find the second to last episode was gruesome, was like very hard to watch, but then it's just because, because like they said, it was very sad, and and I think it was just was like such a. There's some choices that I was like, why is Galadriel walking away from people that are on fire right now? I just had a hard time with certain choices like that. But yeah, yeah, my death, and then they were just like, okay, moving on with the the story, and I was like, oh. <laughs> so I had to have Alex rewind it because we'd watch it together. I was like, wait, I thought they just pulled. I thought I thought uh, Sealder was pulling. I thought it was you. That was pulling Valandale out. And so yeah, that right. when you flopped out, because I mean, all you guys with the long hair, I, I'm very grateful that you guys had good hair because I don't know if you saw the meme going around about all the yeah, extras totally with the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, I made Alex pause for that too because it was pretty, that Look, was pretty they, bad. They need to be able to afford the huge special effects somehow. And so we know they, <laughs> they cut some wig budget. In well, the I'm, and I'm giving them a break. It doesn't matter. But no. It would be so funny if those were actual like real extras here and you just had some person <laughs> listening to this and like just a single tear is going down their face we're really yeah. alienating our, our like five listeners right now who are just like when are they going to mention me when are they going to mention <laughs> <laughs> i know you really i would actually i went to a party where there were a couple actors and i i whispered to my plus one and i was like so he's not the, he's like the worst on this sh- on the show and i went oh my god jessica stop <laughs> <laughs> first of all, anyone could hear me say that. B, it's not doesn't matter. He's like the most charming. He's just not the, the good the a good actor, which is uh. fine. And it was the stupidest thing I've ever said. The most critical I've ever been. And I like out loud said, "I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to give you any opinions." Yeah, it's hard. It's hard for me as well because like watching it, I know everybody, so I can't watch it in the same way. So sure. my viewing of the show is so different to everyone else. Um, so I'm like constantly listening to my friends, like, what do you think? You know, what is it? And I can't, you know, I can't, it's hard, so hard to gauge, but, um, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. It's like, you forget that these are the real people embodying this stuff <laughs> and people can sort yeah. of be so, um, <laughs> callous <laughs> towards like characters, but then again, also the characters aren't you. So it's, it's a weird thing. It's like but we then... have a thing called Shortland Street here and people can be so mean to like the villains of the character, of the um, of the season or whatever, they'll like go up to him on the street and be like, I hate you for what you did. <laughs> and there's yeah. I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm, just, <laughs> I'm doing a role. But I I'm mean, sorry. I, well, well, hold on. A, go ahead, Alex. Sorry. In a weird that. way, that is a compliment because it means their performance was so believable right. and good. That Joff, <laughs> Joffrey, in, right, is a good example of that. Exactly. Like, you're, I, I hate, I almost hated the actor, but he was so, because he was doing it so well you know which one's yeah. joffrey am i lost uh the prince oh no the game of thrones king game of thrones um the, oh the i didn't kid. i don't want to oh okay well yeah, yeah. no no please you two can like continue i think like no, he, but yeah, then he gets a dar and dar in this show oh my I felt god bad for him and he's the bad character oh he's yeah. you know it's interesting. A very sympathetic villain which i enjoyed yeah um and and also the aspects of you know we've talked about this but the aspects of Tolkien's deeper like the deeper implications of his mythology that come along with that character of well he's an orc but he was an elf and so these mm. creatures are you know have souls and should yeah. be treated with respect i guess maybe or it not respect look at, depending on how you see it it makes that choice in the way he does it cuz you really feel for his love for his children the orcs it makes yeah. you think about the 
films in a different way because in the films they do feel like faceless evil beings which is so great because um you don't feel bad when the heroes kill them because you're like yeah these guys are evil and horrible and the urukai are some of the most scary um evil people ever because they are real threatening Mm -hmm. um but you don't never never in the films are you like (laughs) no but after him crying about his children and wanting to have, create a space for his children. I was just like, Oh man. Yeah. I feel bad. I, I don't like Galad- I mean, Galad- I think Galad- was like, I want to wipe them off the face of the earth. I'm like, wow. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, like, and, and I, I really not, enjoyed, that's exactly right. I, I really enjoyed that. They, you know, like we're, you know, you're talking about um, themes of like what war does to people and how that can change people. And we saw that with Galadriel in that scene and then them like sort of dealing with an issue of like genocide in a fantasy series in a kind of serious way that I was like, Mm. oh, this is I enjoy that. That was was probably my favorite scene in the entire um, in the entire show was that. It's interesting because I don't know where you could go where you go with it now, because like, yeah, they're not robots anymore now in my mind. They're not like faceless evil beings. They are. Uh, For lack of a better word, humanized, right? They yes, they, yeah, they have a goal, have a purpose. They yeah. earned my respect for not shying away from that, right? Because um, mm. you can definitely keep it the Gimli Legolas. I've got thirteen or whatever, and you just like unforgivingly slaying orcs for fun. Mm. But you do give yourself some intense storytelling if you choose to show. I th- and I think that's what this whole show did o- overall in general is where, like, Tolkien does black and white, good, evil, cut and dry. And this show, I think, really, like, waited in the gray of all the characters for the most part. Like, oh, that's not the best quality of them. Oh, but I can see that they made an, a good choice there. Or who's nothing was oh, inherently good and bad until it was obvious. Like, I mean, I even Sauron wanted to be somewhat... He wanted to be. I think he was generally, uh, genuinely pen- penitent a little bit. Yeah, yeah. They're they're definitely a great. There's definitely not cut and dry in the series, which I guess makes it different. It's different. You. It's different in you. Yeah, for yeah. sure. We don't like different in you, so that's <laughs> not. I'm not comfortable with that. Yeah, I remember what I remember that scene, that scene with him, with Galadriel and him in the barn, watching that, and um, man, what a what a surprise to be on his side, right, um, <laughs> against Galadriel, because yeah. Galadriel is one of the most influential characters in 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 the work, and you you know usually you you're always whenever Galadriel's in a scene or in a story in the story you're like always rooting for her, but then. You're like, yeah, you you are evil, <laughs> and a little bit, a little you bit. You can't root for her in that moment, right? You can't, you don't, you can't side with her. You can see how she gets to there. You can understand what her, what's driving her to, be so uh, single, single focused, single minded. But you can't, you can't agree with her as someone that's not going through that same exact arc, right? Yeah. So I guess, yeah, her motivation is the grief of and the loss of her brother. Um, I suppose. Yeah. Well, she, I think she's also been in, I guess my, my thought is she's been in battle for so long that um, mm. she's lost. I mean, this is maybe just me adding to it, but she's lost a lot of her own humanity or her own empathy um, because all she, her grief and her thing is all consuming. Now she doesn't even have, like she's not really able to make rational decisions at a certain point. That next episode, then she like says something to Theo's character, which is, which which made me think that she had pondered what Adar had said. She say, what she say? She says, like something about evil. Well, don't you know? Um, don't don't speak let your don't heart praise darken. evil deeds. Don't, oh yeah, don't it darkens praise. the heart. Something yeah, like that. Yeah, which made me think she she thought about that. Um, which kind of felt. Right? I don't know. Like, it, yeah. she'd learn something from Adar. Yeah. No, she didn't live in, I'm going to 
genocide everybody. She didn't... <laughs> yeah, that's right. No. Yeah, Thank that God. had just been her like a motivation, and then that until the Galadriel we see later, and in the, in the, it would be it's hard to rectify those two. Totally. Yeah. But in that moment, you, I, she wanted to piss Adar off, you know. Yes. Then, then again, I guess it does also uh, uh, give weight to the thing that she says in the Lord of the Rings series, where if you know, if you gave me the power, I would be a dark queen. So you, she does have darkness that lives in with her, and she does have. So, so, so maybe the Galadriel we say thousands of years later has, um, you know, uh, useful, usefully incorporated that part of her being into. Into, into her life and is in control of it so maybe it's, it's good that we can it's see still it. there yeah. yeah yeah we need to see that it's a, she has the capacity to be evil um which is quite nice mm-hmm. um yeah <laughs> it's I would an agree. interesting choice would you say if you had a, what if you had a chance at the ring and before you got <laughs> Before you got corrupted, before like the evil part took over, what would you do with the good, with the power of the ring that could like do good? I, um, oh, I think onto most. So I think he's the one person who could be the ring. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I think he would. I think he would leap into the fire. And I think it's good that they took him out early because yeah, Sauron. I mean, the entire plot was to take down onto Mo. I think onto Mo was the central character of um this of of <laughs> of the book. <laughs> Um, and really it was on Tomo versus Sauron. So it should have been a bigger moment. Um, yeah, yeah they no. really bungled that one. Hold on. Have you, have you looked up any fanfic? Is there fanfic of you out there? There has to no, be. I don't know. I just created it, I think. I think you did. I really think you did. And now I'm afraid, but I, like, I'm afraid for you to Google that, but I feel like you have to. I mean, it would make good strategy for Sauron and, uh, Malcor to take out the purest of the, Numenorians early. I well, and this is this answers a question that I had uh, about the show that we mm-hmm. have talked about. Why was Halbrand on that raft? And now we know he had caught wind of Antimo. He was <laughs> he was trying to get to Numenor to take him out early. That's so hoping, now oh, my yeah, right. I, I I can sleep at night knowing the reason. Yeah, yeah. We have about several scenes. Me, just me and um, Holbrand, just on the cutting room floor. It, it, yeah. We get in deep, and um, he tries to kill me in alleyway. I get away. Um, <laughs> 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 he tries to break my arm like he breaks that other guy's arm, but my my arm just doesn't break. <laughs> yeah, it's your arm is actually made of mithril, right? I think that, like that, that's right. That's... I'm yeah, I've got mithril inside me. That's why Sauron wants me so badly. <laughs> yeah, that's how he figured like, out that it could heal heal the other souls and everything. Hey, I in, in my head. Sauron is also a pansexual, so I'm sure he's very attracted to Antimo oh. as well. <laughs> That's also on the cutting. <laughs> well, now we're making more fan fiction, and uh... I really am sorry. I, I weep for your future children. They will be googling and go, Dad. <laughs> Pat, I really, I regret doing the choice of having my eyes open for the the when you see me dead. Because if I had my eyes closed, you know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe Sauron. Maybe my eyes pop open. Sauron's there. You could have been an Uruk, or you could have, he could have turned, you could, Waldreg. Sauron's lover. I don't know. Who, oh my I mean, God. <laughs> I'm not putting words in Listen, uh, your mouth. Listen, no one says you can't come in with prosthetics next time. <laughs> like, they know you, they like you. <laughs> they yeah, didn't kill you knows? off. They didn't kill you off because you were difficult to work with. I can't actually, imagine that. We're approaching my NDI. I can't actually uh, talk about that. Uh, okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, not an orc. Okay. Um <laughs> <laughs> Which totally means he's an orc, hey guys. <laughs> one of there's one yeah. orc too that Alex and I favor oh, because you can just tell oh, yeah. right. he re- like I think I, what I, I appreciate this is when someone just is full body into their their like their no abandon like and that was what was hard for me with improv for a long time was hey I didn't rehearse this for five weeks how do I throw myself full like wholeheartedly into something. Yeah. So when I see it in an actor or someone on stage doing it, you can't help but respect that or be drawn to it. So one of the yeah. guys, like yeah. he's so in it the whole time and he's not stopping. And he's like, even when he's just like background actor, he's moving the whole time, but also not pulling focus. It's very impressive. And I don't think we've seen him die yet. So we're okay. I'm okay. like, I'm still holding out hope that he's still alive. That, that orc. Little, is it little orc boy you call him? We could, yeah, he's boy? our sweet yeah. little orc boy the, son. The one with the helmet, and he's like, "We found him, boss." Uh, we, we the last we saw him, he was in um, 
the uh, I'm blanking on the name of the tower. The tower they collapse. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. and we had we didn't see him after that, so it's mm. unsure. The tower like officially collapsed on, uh, which the mouth of Sauron podcast calls Glob, which was the big guy. So that fe- like yeah. we saw him die, and the thing yeah. is, is like we shouldn't have seen Antimo die. We should have just been like, wait, where's Antimo? Where's Isildur? I guess they're both dead. Go- yeah. God and Beric saves both of you. Come on! Oh yeah, my God! I mean, everyone questions how they write, how they're writing season two, and um, I don't know if I can talk about this, but Jeff Bezos is uh, listening to this call, and he's <laughs> scribbling down everything you're saying right now. Um, they're like, he's, he's he's going into a room and he's like, "I love little orc boy." More, more, more. <laughs> it's like seven people with typewriters, and they're just <laughs> little <Yeah>. orc boy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's be honest. There's seven children that are working against their will. <laughs> oh, yeah, true, true. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and one of them is dressed as little Lord Boy. Yeah, he totally I mean, he's embodying the character. Yeah, I gotta get into the mindset. <laughs> we'll, we'll get a ha- hashtag started for Antimo. We'll do that for you. Oh, please. Please yeah. do. Happily. Um, bring him back, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I totally get that in full embodiment thing. For me, that's a da. Whenever I see a da on screen, like there's like a moment where he just walks down. Uh, I think right before they're about to attack Mordor, and Joseph is Joseph Joseph Maul is yeah. the actor. Um, just he just embodies that uh, remorseful kind of evil. I don't know. It was just so so great to watch him on screen. For that reason, the the, the physical embodiment, um, so it was so great, um, yeah. And he would, I think he, he he's sort of like his um metho- methodology is quite interesting to me as well. He just is so, he just has reams and reams of notes and drawings and paper, and he does, and he he would be in character. Like he's quite, he was quite method, close to method. So. It was just so interesting to be around people like that as me as being a Kiwi actor and not, not being around that style of acting was just so incredible to be around. And he would like, I heard the stories that he'd just like run for hours before he went to set. Like I heard that he would like run for like at least two hours, no matter what the call time was. Like if they had a call time of 1am, he would like get up at 9pm and, and go for a run at least for two hours i was wow. just like man who is this person <laughs> which made him wild yeah. actually and knowing that makes him even more scary when you see him on <laughs> right it's great is did he have to was that normal to have to go in that earlier was that because he had like makeup or... yeah i think so i okay. think so um he would have had an earlier call time yeah. um although it wasn't too much i don't think it was yeah. as bad as the rest of the other the other orcs or the dwarves but I mean, yeah. yeah, you were saying earlier you thought you were going to play a dwarf. I'm sure you were pleased when you saw what some of the other actors had to go through that you weren't. Because yeah. I'm sure they were sitting in the chair for a long time. That would have sucked, but I think it would have been worth it. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. it I don't know. I, yeah. I'd love to. I mean, I could come back as a dwarf, too. I could be a little dwarf boy. Can. You could yeah. You could be our, our, our dwarf boy son. We never saw the faces of Durin's child. Mm. And also, seven dwarf people have to get a ring. So yeah. who's to say you could? The dwarf lords oh, yeah. were mentioned uh, that yeah. we haven't seen yet. So yeah, this is where you start putting on prosthetics and doing TikToks as a dwarf, <laughs> and they start seeing you as a new new person altogether. Well, I thought about creating a new like identity and re auditioning. Um, oh yeah, you know, it's, not, it's not. So here's the, what you do though: is every Christmas. You send them a gift basket. Thank you so much for casting me. Thank you so much for letting me be part of this, you guys. I will never forget how much fun it was. Can't wait till we find another opportunity to do it again. You just always kiss. You always send chocolate covered strawberries, and I'm you'll never be. No, please do it. It's the way you go. <laughs> you, you get you get a PR person, and you get chocolate covered strawberries. I like my first commercial. I sent uh, chocolate covered strawberries to the production company, and they like emailed me immediately like what thank you so they were thrilled they were, they were thrilled and then <laughs> who, never who do you want to be again. who do you who, what who would you want to be on the show that's a really great question Ki- you're kicking you're kicking one actor out um of, of oh. and they have to be established so it's not characters. a new character it's no an no, existing no so character. they've recast and it's you oh. and you also have to deal with the backlash of the recast but yes. they, they did just recast uh henry cavill in the witcher so it's entirely possible right. 
Exactly. So Which we're just yeah. not gonna have a comment on right now. Okay. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious. Oh, I, you know what? I think I have our answer. I think you'd be recast as Kevin, Alex. And I don't want to be, be Kevin, but but Kevin. I would be. Uh, what's what's her name? Arendil or what? Arendil. Arian. Yeah. Arian. I hate her. I hate her so much, and it's primarily because she's attractive and pretty, and mm. I'm jealous. And you know, I thought I was ba- I was past that, but I just and she's younger than me, and I just can't compete. So I want to show them that older actresses can still be sexy. And I'm not that much older than her, I'm sure. It's just, I, I act like I'm com- sexy is what you take from their character. Uh, say that again. Se- oh, she, is yes, sexy? she's se- she's the, she's. Um, here's why I think mm-hmm. she's got the most traditional, um, modern sex appeal. So I feel like. Uh-huh. They, I, it's hard to ignore that, I guess, is my point. So, like, you, you can't ignore that she looks like a modern, attractive young woman. Uh, I see. She looks right. like, like, you know, in the same way that, like, uh, Bronwyn's wearing a maxi dress. That's a very modern looking sh- dress for, like, two episodes. But it didn't bother me. But, like, she's... Like, she everyone does. else looks, like, dirt on their face and then he cuts the hair and she looks like a model. <laughs> she's, get, she's killing it. She looks yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Looks I, if great, I was yeah. a Rondier, I would also... I would be yeah. DTF, too. Um, yeah. I, I guess I it felt like she Arian came in as, like, oh, here's our young female contingency because they didn't sexualize Morpheth, which I thought was a really nice thing. They didn't sexualize most of the female characters. I mean, there's so much to celebrate with the show with regard to that and she's not an overly sexualized character too she's just very beautiful and and it's one of the you know couple uh romantic subplots we get so although it's very very brief with her with her and kevin yeah like two scenes i think we lost some scenes between those two oh i'm i'm sure Um, yeah yeah but which i don't know what they were so i can only speculate as, as as you guys can but yeah it definitely felt her... felt like that watching. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I see. I saw her as like a um, as being, and uh, being a diplomat and a nerd. That's what I saw her being as. Um, that was her archetype that I saw her fit as. Which was weird. Yeah, it is weird that they had the kind of love relationship with Kim and then when he was hitting on her and stuff. But I guess yeah. I think that pays off later in season two because you see people kind of going, "What? What's the point here?" Because um, mm. it did seem like a little shoehorned and a little forced, and like, "Oh, she's just so happens to be there when um, Farazon's talking," and she, you know, um, I think yes, maybe one extra scene probably would have given us more context. But I and I'm, not, I'm choosing not to be too critical about it because I'm sure they'll be more. They'll they'll be doing more in season two. I think mm. they have to be. I think that the goal, maybe, I mean, I'm just putting myself in the writer's shoes, but like the goal, because architectural, architecture is such a huge thing for Numenor. And so to not talk about it or represent it in some way um, would be, like as a viewer, I'd be like, oh, that's annoying. And so I think, I think that's what they're trying to go with, with her, like in, she kind of, I mean, they end up, well, they established those cities and on Middle Earth. Um, yeah. So, oh, interesting. So somebody um, has to design Minas Tirith. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I thought that's where that might go or could go. Or that's what she represents. Like she is the, and also the architecture being linked to Elendil, like kind of the heart and um, the the pure. He's kind of quite pure, and he what is he the um, what do they call that that fraction? Their fraction is called uh, the faithful. The faithful. Yeah. So for the architecture, the heart of the Mm. architecture to come from that family would be an interesting um choice especially because it is Elendil and Isildur right on the mm. that are the those two big statues in Middle Earth is that right Alex? yes yeah, yeah yeah that's right I th- um I think it, yeah in the movies I think it's Isildur and Narian in the books but yeah oh oh, oh that's right yeah that's interesting yeah, yeah. that's good extrapolation yeah, I, I, I only say her too because I feel like I I feel like people wouldn't get too mad if I kicked her out to, cause like it's not a huge character yet, and no, they, no, they might not. Rem- I mean, they'll be sad that they don't have any more fluffy lips to look at because her lips are very beautiful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it could be also also 
interesting choice to do like a divide too if she becomes evil um, what if she became evil and then had to choose between leaving and staying that was another thing oh. I was thinking about but yeah. I think she's Alex thinks she's going to be a Farazan uh, friendly. Yeah. Uh, Cuz I like, basically she's going to look into the Pelantir and see what Muriel has been seeing and she won't know why Numenor is going to do- fall, but she'll I my thought is she'll extrapolate that because they went to Middle-earth that's why Numenor will and, fall. And I think that's also why they have that romantic subplot with Kemen is to like bring her up as a reason to bring her into like Farazan's right. inner circle, which we see her in when they're in Tarpalantir's tower. Uh, but I think for sure, even though she is, I think it's interesting. You're bringing up like the bringing in like the idea of the faithful to the architecture. Maybe she hmm. eventually comes back to her family side, but I think it'll be interesting if they go with, she's with Farazan and the Kingsmen who are kind of the reason for the downfall of Numenor. Um, but the rest of her family is the faithful. So you have that kind of familial tension there. Cause I think they need yeah. that, especially if we're going to get an in, in the next season or the season after that, who is the most faithful of the faithful, apparently, as we've been told, uh, in that, yeah. in that episode yeah. where they name drop him. So interesting that, yeah, yeah. I <gasps> think that'd be interesting if that plays out that way. I hope I could be an Aryan gender bent. An Aryan? Who say why? Actually, there was a hot second where I thought a Aryan was, or the sister, I can't get her name right, was going to be Sauron. I was so on board with it. I was like, you know uh, what? That's really cool. That could be cool. It would be totally never anything anyone would think of doing, but I, it's I didn't hate it. a long game from Sauron. Right. 100%. 100%. And then... Your Antimo's engaged to her, and then it makes sense why the romantic subplot between Antimo and Sauron was. Well, we you know full circle. We, we just if we get enough money together, maybe we could get we could buy the rights off Amazon. That start sounds a, right. Start a that Kickstarter. Right to me. <laughs> Listen, we could work. We're, we're all funny. We could just do it and, and get away with it for parody's sake. You know, you never know. <laughs> there you go. Okay, I love it. it. We'll talk to some lawyers. <laughs> no, that's the whole thing is you don't until I tell you to not do it. That's like you, you, you don't let anyone know you're doing it and that and then wait till they slap you on the wrist. That's if I've learned anything in my time. Um, yeah. So what are you doing now? What's what's your what's your life like? Um, yeah, uh, I just doing improv, um, a lot of a bit of stand up um, and just auditioning for things. Um, are you coming that, out to yeah. the States like or like do you want to stay in New, New Zealand? Do you feel like it's. Like there's enough work out there or what's like, where, where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah, uh, could do, uh, depending on, where, I, I mean, it's actor's life, right? You chase where the jobs go. Um, so um, could do, but there is a lot of stuff that shoots in New Zealand, which is quite nice. And but it at is best, nice. At best, um, I just want to work on cool stuff. So if it's being shot here or if it's being shot in America, then happy to go where the work is. But yeah. We'll be happy to take you to lunch when you're in LA, or when, yeah. if 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 uh, you're if Alex is still in Chicago, if you go to Chicago, he'll help you out. I'm, Sounds good. Yeah, why not? Yeah, why not? Are you, we'll, we'll make, I'll make you do improv. I got to do improv at Austin too. You're right that it's an interesting town. It was like a lot of um, it was a lot of progressive, you know, cool kind of people trying to do cool things, a lot of music and all this stuff, and then people putting like anti-abortion papers on people's cars throughout like the on the broadway street it was it was a really weird meeting of sensibilities yeah yeah i found that with austin as well it was such a such a interesting place in that way that it was a meeting of those two worlds like but i think that's it was quite interesting to be around it was so opposite to new zealand because new zealand is so one thing but austin was many things at once well, they say, I'll keep Austin weird. So it was, just, it was just everywhere you looked felt like a new world, a new kind of little microcosm of something. I guess it didn't feel growing. that weird to me because L.A. is psychotic. Oh, <laughs> so, really? I mean, L.A. just is so, – I've been, I've lived here my whole life. I was from the Valley, which was technically – means nothing to you, but it's not the city <laughs> proper. But – Every, there's times where I'm all of a sudden on the other side of the city and I'm like, I've, I've never seen this section and it's the most unique section of, of LA to date. So 
and, and you know, you at one point I'm looking at the most beautiful sunset, and then I could turn to the left, and someone's taking a shit in front of me. So right. it's it just is the that's weird, I guess. So <laughs> I, I don't I don't think someone who's playing the Beatles and the other people are playing the Rolling Stones. That's not you know mm. that's not weird. <laughs> But um, but yes, it it was a really interesting. Um, t- we're not in Kansas anymore. Moment when you see the people like campaigning for their pro life beliefs. It was a, a versus a lot of liberal com- comedians or comedy. It's mm. very. It was very interesting. It was a what's the word? I can't think of it. Juxtapose. Yeah. Maybe? Yep. Yeah. Was, I th- I'm more thinking like uh, when you're in a, when uh, that's when you're in a new land. This is what I'm really uh, good at is um, not describing the one. word, but then not finding it. I, I struggle with that. <laughs> Thank. I'm so glad we're gonna make such a great team. Um, yeah. I'm I miss Malaprops, and uh, but that's part of my charm at this point. I, Alex, right? It's my charm. Yes. Thanks. It's very charming. Awesome. <laughs> um, so you're only on in- in- Instagram. Is there anywhere else people could keep up with what you're doing? Uh, no, Instagram's the best place to catch up with me. Um, cram, yeah, Cram Anthony. Um, yeah, follow me. I usually post stuff that I'm doing. I'm making some like film content that I want to put out. So, that, awesome. yeah, nice. I see that. Well, yeah. and if, if you'll have us, we'd love to have you back again. And you can talk all the crap about your friends in season two. Yeah, well, 100%. No. <laughs> of course. Great. Well, thank you so much for being on this show. Thank you guys for having me. It was really nice to listen to uh when i was listening to your episodes and listen to your thoughts um and hearing what resonated with you and what you were struggling with was, was interesting to hear um other point of views that i can't gauge because i was in it you know so you're too close yeah, to thank it you. well i'm glad yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad that you can hear it because it is nice to like, learn from it because it's not like you're going to be able to change anything no. but but knowing what you can relate to with people instead of being uh uncontrollably biased is is a nice thing hmm yeah for sure. That's great. And seeing how my choices land for people and what people They landed for us. We are we're <laughs> yes. we're going to have onto moment. It's just going to he's going to be living throughout every season. Okay, good. All through season okay, 5. Okay, good. He'll have a whole storyline and I can't promise he won't be falling in love with Sour and I can't promise it. We'll just see what happens. <laughs> okay, good. Good. All right, thanks Anthony. Thank you. 